Welcome to Fan Fave with Katrina. Fan Fave with Katrina. It's time to talk pop culture. Welcome back. I'm your host, Katrina, and this is Fan Fave, the ultimate pop culture podcast for fans of all forms of entertainment. If you love music, television, film, theater, or anything in between, you're in the right place. So last week, TikToker Noah Miller made a series of videos casually using the Fifth Harmony song, All In My Head, Flex. The use of this song, I guess, reminded people of Fifth Harmony and ignited an ongoing conversation about the girl group all over social media. Multiple members of the group even got involved. And as someone who is a super fan of Fifth Harmony from 2013 until approximately 2018 when they had their little hiatus... We have to talk about them because I was sat for these conversations. And so today we're doing a full Fifth Harmony episode. This podcast episode is my contribution to the Fifth Harmony renaissance that started last week. And it ain't even 727, but it is February 27th. So maybe that counts for something. I don't know. Also, Normani is finally back. So yeah, we have a lot to chat about today. But first, it's time for a pop recap. Let's talk about some of the trending topics in the entertainment world that I have not been able to stop talking about since I last spoke to you all on this podcast. A lot of exciting new movies are quickly approaching like Dune 2 and Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, but we're also getting some new looks at some other upcoming highly anticipated films. The Zendaya-led tennis romance movie Challengers just dropped a brand new trailer. Challengers follows Tashi, a tennis star who's on her way to do big things until she gets a career-ending injury. She then starts to coach two of her male best friends who also happen to play tennis, and with that, a love triangle begins. You guys, it looks so good. It's directed by Luca Guadagnino, who also recently directed Call Me By Your Name and Bones and All. Challengers is set to release on April 27th, and I will be sat for it. I also came across this trailer for a movie called Snack Shack. It comes out on March 15th, so a little over two weeks from now, and it seems like it falls into one of my favorite genres of movies, period, comedies. Seriously, it's a coming-of-age comedy that takes us back to the early 90s where two teenage best friends invest in a snack shack at their local pool to try and make some money. And of course, chaos then ensues. The movie, which stars Gabriel LaBelle of The Fablemans and that upcoming SNL 1975 movie, as well as Connor Shane has been described as a nostalgic journey for those who came of age before the era of cell phones and a hilarious escape for those who wish they had. Right up my alley as someone who had a little bit of both, I guess. This movie just looks like a lot of fun though, so check out the trailer and let me know what you think. Another quick movie news thing I want to chat about is this Hollywood Reporter article that revealed that Avengers 5 will no longer be called the Kang Dynasty. They say that sources told them even before Jonathan Major's conviction and subsequent firing from Marvel that the studio was making moves to minimize the character of Kang after Ant-Man Quantumania. I just want to say, I know we can't really know what's going on, but I think that's Cap because yes, Ant-Man was a flop, but if nothing else, all of the bad reviews praised one thing and that was Kang. So I'm interested to see how they rework this big bad for Marvel Phase 5 or Phase 6. I don't know which one we're in now, but... I really thought that they were just going to recast King and not get rid of him altogether, but we'll see what they do with that. I really just fear for Ant-Man though, because if they're downplaying Kang because Ant-Man flopped, which I don't fully believe, but whatever, what does that mean for my favorite Avenger Ant-Man? Like, that's what I care about. Should I be worried that he's not going to get an Ant-Man 4? The last film thing I want to talk about is this newly announced slate of Beatles movies, which has had everyone talking about lately. Four separate Beatles biopic films are in the works by director Sam Mendes, and they are set to release in 2027. All four movies will be interconnected stories, but each one will be told from a different band member's POV. All jokes aside, many of which went over my head as someone who isn't that familiar with Beatles lore, I do think this is a creative concept. I mean, most of the jokes online were centered around how different each of the members' movies will be, and I think it's going to be really cool to have that unique take considering a group of people who were together but from different perspectives. Another big joke going around on Twitter, at least though, is this idea of what other groups would make a good set of biopics like this. And obviously One Direction was the most tossed around name, 
on my side of the internet at least. And I just want to address that the way people said some One Direction members would have flop movies, I disagree. Because they are all a puzzle piece put together and I bet you someone like Liam, which was one of the main members that everyone was trying to drag, Liam would probably have one of the more interesting movies. I mean, remember he went on that podcast and alluded to all that tea in the world but did not spill it? Biopic time. But yeah, all jokes aside, I think the Beatles are the best group to make movies like this on. I've been calling on my friend who's like a huge Beatles super fan to get me ready for these movies because I don't know much about them other than their music and I want to be entertained when the movies come out but I also want to be able to understand them and that Big Time Rush movie was not enough. I have three years though. It should be fun. It should be exciting. I'm looking forward to them. In the Broadway world, we're saying hello and we're saying goodbye. Water for Elephants had its very first preview over the weekend. I'm seeing some really great reviews coming out about it so far. I heard the sits probe already in some videos that the show posted, and I was already sat for the circus theme, so now I'm pretty sure this will be the next Broadway show that I see, which is super exciting. We did say goodbye, though, because the Neil Diamond musical A Beautiful Noise has announced its closing date to be on June 30th. I personally never saw this show, I wasn't the target audience, and I was really surprised that they were able to find and sustain their target audience for this long. I only know one Neil Diamond song, I mean, Sweet Caroline, I feel like this is the one everybody knows. So I mean, I never really want to see a show close, but I was really surprised at how well it lasted, and I think that should be celebrated. It opened during the fall 2022 season, where most of the shows that opened alongside it have since shuttered. I mean, Almost Famous, K-Pop, Some Like It Hot, Kimberly Akimbo's closing in April. I mean, that leaves the only standing new musical from that season to be And Juliet Now, which is deserved. Love And Juliet. And then many shows that even opened after A Beautiful Noise have since shuttered too. So over time, I have kind of gained an interest in seeing this show just to see like what it's all about since it's outlived other musicals that I thought were really great. So it must be great. I also really want to quickly just share my excitement for this new production of Bye Bye Birdie happening at the Kennedy Center because they just announced the cast, which consists of Christian Borrell as Albert, Krista Rodriguez as Rosie, and Ephraim Sykes as Conrad Birdie. I think I'm most excited about Christian Borrell because he's one of my favorite Broadway actors. I saw him in Little Shop of Horrors as well as Some Like It Hot and he's great. I've also seen Krista Rodriguez a few times recently. She played Cinderella in Into the Woods but I saw her at this Broadway concert a couple years ago and then I also saw her in the collaboration which was a play but she was good in that too. And then Ephraim Sykes, he also has a very strong resume previously playing David Ruffin in Ain't Too Proud, The Temptations musical. This is a Broadway Center Stage production at the Kennedy Center, so it won't be around for long, but it is coming in June, and I cannot wait for it because the cast already sounds phenomenal. Now in television, I just want to talk really quickly about one thing that I haven't really been talking about in depth lately, and that's The Bachelor, and it's because I'm always recording this podcast on a Sunday or Monday morning for it to release on Tuesday, so it always sounds like I'm a whole episode behind on The Bachelor because I record right before a new episode of it comes out, and then I publish after it comes out, but I just want to say... Last week's episode was so chef's kiss. Like, I have to talk about this episode. Because Maria, being the most hated one in the house, getting the best date of the season, and her two biggest haters getting kicked out the same episode, cinema. And honestly, if I was Jess or Leia, I'd be absolutely devastated. For one, Jess, because that was so crushing for him to tell her he wasn't into her. Like, if she just would have waited until the rose ceremony, it would have been less embarrassing. But nope, she got booted out early and we all had to see it. And then Leia, I think Leia's arc is kind of crazy because she started off with everyone calling her a girl's girl and then she transformed into being, like, seen as a huge hater. But then, like... The reason she was called a girl's girl was because in episode one, she had this card where she could steal a one-on-one date from someone else during the season. And she just dramatically threw the card into a fire because she didn't think it was fair to steal from somebody else. And you guys, look where that got her. She was never picked for a one-on-one date with Joey. She never had a chance, but yet she did have a chance and she threw it away and still got no brownie points for it in the end because then she got a messy drama edit anyways. And you guys, the producers are so messy because 
when she was in the limo leaving Canada, the camera person was like, do you have any regrets from this season? Like, obviously they were asking about that card and it was just silence. Like, Leia didn't say a thing. I was dying. But anyways, we will see how things continue to play out with our final six, which might be a final four now that this podcast is out, but we'll see. Now in music, two huge tours kicked off since we last spoke. Niall Horan's This Show began its European leg and Olivia Rodrigo's Guts World Tour kicked off in California. I will be attending both of these tours and just seeing the set lists and the staging, it's all so exciting. I love that Niall's set list is still pretty inclusive of his first two albums and I guess especially Heartbreak Weather since he never even got the chance to tour that album because of the pandemic. But I did see he also sang some of my favorite songs from his debut album still that I never would have thought would still be on the set list after three albums, which are Fire Away and Since We're Alone. So I'm super hype about that. And then as every other One Direction member has done on their tours, Niall also does sing One Direction music. And guys, the song that he chose, I almost cried seeing the videos on Twitter. He sings Night Changes, my second favorite One Direction song that I've never heard live because I never saw One Direction in concert. I just, he's been changing the set list like every single night but I need that to stay the same for the North American leg. Like, I know he keeps changing this, but please, me hearing this live would truly be a life-changing experience, okay? And then Olivia Rodrigo. We have to talk about the Guts World Tour kickoff because it looks so good. It's giving full production. The stage is a butterfly. She's flying around the arena on a moon. And the set list, I have no notes. I don't know why I was worried about the set list when she literally only has two albums, but I'm dressing up around a specific song when I go and it's not one that's talked about a ton. I don't know. I thought my outfit would end up being the song that got cut from the set list, but she does sing all of Guts and then she still sings my favorite songs off of Sour which I wasn't expecting but I am so happy about so yeah this tour is gonna be huge I'm going in July which is so far from now but I'm counting down the days it's 145 days I'm counting down I'm so excited for my time at the Guts World Tour The other music related thing that I want to say is that I feel like we are in peak music release season right now. There's just so much new music coming out, new albums from some of the biggest artists all so soon, and it's like more and more people keep steadily teasing and announcing new albums. So I'm very excited and a little overwhelmed at the same time, but it's all in good fun. Like in the near future, even just to name a few, we've got Ariana Grande, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, Bleachers, Justin Timberlake, Shakira, Casey Musgraves, so many new releases. And ending with that, I just want to shout out some of my favorite new music releases that we got since we last spoke. Um, Me Before You by The Bleachers, Saturn by SZA, Drown by Justin Timberlake, Yeah by Flyanna Boss. So yeah, a lot of really fun stuff for you to add to your playlist. Let me know what you've been listening to from this latest New Music Friday. So for our wild card section this week, I just have one thing I want to focus on, or one person I should say, and that's Bridget Mindler. She is just absolutely incredible. For those that don't know who she is, she is a former Disney Channel star. She played Teddy in Good Luck Charlie. She was in one of the best Disney Channel original movies ever made, Lemonade Mouth. And she was one of the most interesting characters, or I guess had one of the most interesting storylines in Wizards of Waverly Place. She played Juliet, the vampire that Justin dates. Also, I think she was in Jonas too for like one episode, just like an excellent catalog of Disney Channel stuff that she was a part of. And she also sings, and it's always been like a running conversation on social media that she had some of the most strongest yet criminally underrated music from that Disney Channel era. I mean, Ready or Not, 515, Hurricane, I honestly think it's so good because it just feels like real music. Like, it doesn't sound like kitty Disney Channel music, and I sound silly saying this because I was a kid listening to Disney Channel music back then when this was coming out, and it was on Disney Channel, Radio Disney, and all of that, but it's very R&B, it's a little rap, like, she delivered bops. And now she's still sung a little bit, acted a little bit here and there. But y'all, like, I feel like she was kind of quiet and nobody knew all of this was going on. But she got her bachelor's degree at the University of Southern California since leaving Disney Channel. She got her master's degree from MIT and she got her JD, her Juris Doctor, from Harvard Law. She's an absolute genius. And what has people talking right now and like it's been trending about her all week long is that it's been announced that she launched a brand new startup 
called Northwood Space. It's like a satellite data communications company, and it's already backed by investors with millions of dollars. It has the goal of mass producing satellite ground stations. And don't completely ask me what that means, even though I have an engineering degree. I think it's something with like transmitting communications between like satellites and outer space, something like that, you guys. But it's really cool. And she also just announced that her and her husband have adopted a son. So congratulations to them. I just think that the child star industry can be so rough and there are a lot of sad stories that come out just about like the trauma or the bad experiences they go through and a lot of like ex Disney stars they end up in trouble and just like hard lives so I just really love to see a success story like I really think this should be something that's celebrated so congratulations to Bridget Mindler she's absolutely doing the thing. Now, really quickly, what I've been up to, over the weekend, I went to a local theater production of Into the Woods. It was actually my little cousin's high school production, so shout out to Cameron. He played the wolf and played violin in the orchestra, too. That's on being multi-talented, okay? This show was so much fun, though. It was my second time seeing Into the Woods done on the stage. It's one of my favorite musicals, but this was my first time seeing it as a real full production because the 2022 Broadway revival that I saw, while it was unique, it didn't really Come with a lot of the bells and whistles. It was very minimalistic, so I really appreciated seeing this production that I saw over the weekend and how I was actually able to see how they did the effects differently. And just that whole high school cast was just phenomenal. So congratulations to all of them. It also just made me, as a former high school theater kid, miss performing myself. Like, I really just love that kind of stuff. I love supporting local theater, and I was really proud to see my cousin. I had a lot of fun doing that. Also, outside of the new stuff that's come out this week, lately I've been getting a lot into Chapel Roan's music. It's so good. Her album, The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess, has been on repeat. For some reason, there's always some song from it consistently stuck in my head. So yeah, I recommend that album. I think my favorite song by her right now is After Midnight, but she did just have her first ever televised performance recently on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and she sung Red Wine Supernova, which is another really strong one. And then in television, for those that don't know, for a long time, I've been struggling to find a new sitcom to really get into and enjoy. My favorite one of all time is How I Met Your Mother, and I finished that like literally like two or three years ago in 2021, I think. And I haven't felt the same way about a sitcom ever since. I've just been like desperately trying to fill that missing hole in my heart for a sitcom where like I can just sit down and watch it like a long running sitcom that's already over. And I've like started so many different ones and not finished them. Like probably every popular sitcom known to man, I've probably started it and not finished it in the past two years. And most recently, I've done that with 30 Rock, which surprisingly, I've never seen before, especially considering like the whole comedy, NBC, New York City thing. That was my whole brand in college. So it's like really weird that I never watched it. But now I am having fun watching it. So we'll see if I actually watch it until the end or if this is just another one that I end up dropping. Hopefully not, because I'm really trying to enjoy a new sitcom. And I'll keep you all updated if I continue to like this show. Okay, now our last section in the pop recap today is the fandom corner where we look into the world of fans and see what's being discussed, debated, or talked about the most in different online fan communities. Right now, there's a lot of rumors going around about Harry Styles and his new era of music. I have no clue if there's any truth to it or what is actually going on, but the latest rumor is one that's kind of been around for a while that Harry will be announcing a stadium tour. And that has led to a ton of kind of weird discourse on the internet about it because people started to complain about Harry doing stadiums and then people started to complain about people complaining about Harry doing stadiums. Y'all know how miserable people be on there. But anyways, I don't know why I even log on anymore. I just happened to come across this and I want to share my opinions on this subject because it goes way beyond Harry anyways. And it's that I agree with the stadium concert haters. I do not want Harry to do stadiums either. I just favor arenas for so many reasons and so I just wanted to do a quick little debate I guess on my pros and cons of stadium concerts for this fandom corner and before I complain about stadiums I will give stadium tours a little bit of love because there are some good things that come out of stadium tours one 
fireworks, who doesn't love fireworks? And two, if the artist participates, there's way more room for fan activations. And really this can happen in an arena tour too, but I feel like in my experience, it's more common to happen in a stadium. So like photo booths and sets inside and outside. I'm also thinking about the merch trucks and like the radio stations with the DJs posted out outside of the stadium. And then even like fans tailgating and hanging out in the parking lot. It all just feels a bit more grand with stadium tours. So I'd say that's another pro. But the negatives, they just outweigh the positives. I'm sorry. The biggest problem for me, really, is just the large scale of stadium shows. I mean, I'm someone who tends to go cheap on concert tickets. I'm not going to lie. I do. And by go cheap, I mean I'm just a responsible spender, or I try to be. So I tend to shoot for, you know, no more than like 200 to 250 max on any one ticket. I feel like I try. That's like my max. And that price in an arena is always going to be a way better view than that same price of a ticket in a stadium. Or like if I bought section 400 tickets in an arena, sometimes that's like the equivalent distance to the stage is like the last row of section 100 in a stadium. So then imagine like the the nosebleeds of a stadium. It's like so much more spread out and so much harder to get a good view, but for the same expensive price. Another issue is something that I've never had an issue with personally, but it is something that's always on my mind, the weather. I've heard so many horror stories about rain and thunderstorms ruining a concert, and like that wouldn't have happened if the show was indoors to begin with. And I also dislike amphitheater shows for this reason too, but yeah, stadiums, outside, no. I'm actually kind of worried about it too for my Eras Tour show because the Miami date is in the middle of hurricane season, but we're not going to talk about that. I'm not even going to speak it, but weather is another negative against stadiums. I also feel like stadiums don't work as well if you aren't a grand spectacle artist. Like that can also negatively contribute to the less intimate setting if you aren't filling that space. Like Taylor Swift's Eras Tour or Beyonce's Renaissance Tour, really either of those two artists, any of their tours that you can pick and pull from their stadium tours, they always do such a great job at filling that stadium space. I mean, they have different stages, they're going back and forth, like there's a lot happening and there's a lot going on. So it doesn't feel like a tiny stage and a tiny person on the stage and that's all you're seeing. It's much more grand to fill that stadium. But going back to Harry, I do feel like Harry could continue in arenas, I think. Maybe I'm speaking under the same miscalculations that I discussed in last week's episode where I'm misjudging the level of Harry's fame. But I do feel like I'm saying he could comfortably continue in arenas because compared to some other artists I feel like his tickets have never been super inaccessible or super difficult to get in my experience and I've been around since day one of his solo career I got tickets to his first solo tour through resale for 20 bucks so I know how easy things used to be versus how things are now and I still don't think with his last tours that it was that hard to get his arena tour tickets like yes they did sell out but the resale wasn't like 400 500 dollars just to get in the building compared to some other high demand arena tours like olivia rodrigo for example which is happening right now i just found that unless it was harry ween or like one night only you could find a ticket pretty easily and even for harry ween and one night only i did manage to get tickets for those resale or just like after the fact and I've never spent more than like 200 300 dollars for Harry tickets for any of my shows so it's not even like super expensive when you do get the resale so I just I've never had a problem with getting his tickets but I do know that the demand is there if he wanted to do stadiums because he did do stadiums in Europe it's just not my preference for shows because of the reasons that I just explained. I will be there though regardless. I still pull up to stadium shows. I mean, I have two stadium shows lined up for this year that I'm excited about. But even though they aren't my favorite, I just can't wait for this new era of HS4 because even if the rumors aren't true, it still has to be coming eventually. It's been a while since our last Harry release and I'm sure he's working on something. But yeah, let me know on social media what you prefer, arenas or stadium tours. I'm probably going to do a little poll and we can share the results on next week's episode but y'all already know i'm definitely an arena girly that's all for this week's pop recap though let's get into the topic for today so as i teased in our opening of this episode today is all about fifth harmony i'm gonna take you all on a little journey of their music while also sharing some of my favorite fifth harmony memories we'll also chat a little bit about the solo careers of all five girls today so let's get into it 
Fifth Harmony began way back in 2012 on the popular singing competition show, The X Factor. The same show that birthed One Direction and Little Mix, but the American version. They were formed in the exact same way as the latter groups on the show. Camila Cabello, Ali Brooke, Normani Corday, Dinah Jane, and Lauren Haregi each auditioned as solo musicians on the show. But then, before being eliminated, they were placed together to form a group. And that group was known as L-Y-L-A-S, or Love You Like a Sister, before becoming 1432, which was supposed to mean I Love You Too. I don't know how. But eventually, when they made it to the top 12, America was allowed to vote on a new name, and thus we got Fifth Harmony. I watched a lot of X Factor back in the day. Honestly, I missed the show, but I really don't remember much about their season. I know I watched it because I remember some other stuff, but X Factor is where they got their start. And I mean, watching their old performances on the show, they are fun as old X Factor performances tend to be just to see artists growth because sometimes they're a little interesting. I mean, look at One Direction when they were up there. But yeah, Fifth Harmony ended up placing third on the show, but it didn't matter. X Factor judges Simon Cowell and L.A. Reid saw potential in them and they were ultimately signed to both Psycho Music and Epic Records. On July 16th, 2013, Fifth Harmony's debut single, Miss Moving On, was released. I think if it wasn't during X Factor, this was around the time that I started to become a fan of them. And of course, why not? They got picked up by Radio Disney. They were this cute new girl group. Yeah, the lyrics are silly to listen to now, but like... Shake it off like an Etch-a-Sketch. That was a moment. I'm realizing that barely like two weeks after this single released was when I saw them live in concert for the very first time. They had embarked on this Harmonize America tour. It was like a free tour where they are playing malls all across the country. And this was my era of not really using social media, so I had no clue about it. I was actually on vacation in Orlando, Florida. My whole family was down there because we had this huge destination family reunion. And we were hanging out at Disney Springs, which was downtown Disney at that time. And we literally stumbled into the show happening. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, that's Fifth Harmony. Like I had no clue, but I was so excited because I loved Miss Moving On. And this was like a Radio Disney sponsored show. I have pictures of me there and I just look like such a baby in them. (laughs) If I remember correctly, they sang a few songs off their later to be released EP, as well as some covers. I know they sang Red by Taylor Swift. And I remember them sounding so good, like Over all the years when people would drag them on Twitter, I would think of this specific show and how vocally strong I thought they sounded because a good amount of it was an acoustic set and they were actually harmonizing like fifth harmony. And I think compared to my later time seeing them, they lost quite a bit of that. On October 22nd, 2013, Fifth Harmony released Better Together, their EP. For this episode, I actually re-listened to all of Fifth Harmony's studio albums, including this EP, in full. So I'm going to share my thoughts now over 10 years later. Better Together feels like a full nostalgia trip, a throwback to when I was 12, when I was in middle school. A silly fun fact actually with me in this album is that they would sometimes record Spanish versions of their songs. And for this EP, they did a full Spanish version called Juntos. And as a girl who was taking Spanish classes in middle school, I had those lyrics down. Like I would watch the Spanish lyric videos to learn these songs in Spanish. But going back to the EP itself, Don't Wanna Dance Alone is a certified bop of an opener. It's one of my favorites on the EP. Also, Better Together, the title track. It's so cute. It's girly. It has the best bridge on the EP. No debating there. Like the way that Camila sings, I want you back. And then, (laughs) not me trying to sing, but y'all know what I'm talking about if you know the song. And then all of the runs and the high notes after that, it's the best bridge. After Better Together, we go into some pretty average, forgettable tracks, to me at least. Like, Who Are You? And Leave My Heart Out of This, which Leave My Heart Out of This is kind of nice. But when we end the album with the anthem that is me and my girls, this was my favorite back then. It's also the best music video of that era. Like, come on, get Britney Demi One Direction Bieber on it. Exactly. The Break It Down Bridge. Exactly. And when I saw this song live back in 2013, I think it immediately made me know that Normani was a star because of that dance break. She ate it up, y'all. But she was always the dancer of the group. 
In general, though, Better Together is a very safe project. It's very Radio Disney, preteen girls. And while I'm mentioning age groups, I always think it's so weird looking back at how young a lot of my favorite artists that I had growing up were at that time. I felt like when people were older than me, they were just older. But the thought of them being thrown into a girl group in such a way at like 15, 16, 17... I just, I felt like that had to be overwhelming. Like, I couldn't imagine doing any of that at that age. I always thought they were just, like, older than that for some reason. Not old, but older. I don't know. Like, One Direction, what do you mean they were only 19 when they were selling out stadiums internationally? That's a lot of pressure at that age, and you don't even realize it until you're 19, too, because I was, like, 12 then. My last thought with Better Together, though, is on a completely unrelated note, or not really because he was heavily affiliated with them, but after listening to this album, my title auto-played right into Austin Mahone, and I took a massive detour because I was Austin Mahone's number one biggest fan between 2012 and early 2015. I'm so sorry, it was not you, it was me, I was his biggest fan. Just had to say that because Austin Mahone was iconic back then. On February 3rd, 2015, Fifth Harmony released Reflection, their official debut album. And y'all, if you were a fan back then, like, remember how long this took to come out? The wait felt like forever. But that's the first thing I think about when I think about this album. So I was so sad when this album came out, when it finally came back. And I'm just going to talk about Austin Mahone again, because do y'all remember the 2014 Austin Mahone tour, where the opening acts were the Vamps, Shawn Mendes, and Fifth Harmony? I could talk for hours about that tour, but I don't remember if they were on the set list because of this specific YouTube videos that I'm thinking of. They were soundcheck videos, but there were two videos of Fifth Harmony performing Reflection and Going Nowhere, and I had those songs and choreo down before the album was even out. Like, I was waiting. Those were my two favorites because I would just watch and rewatch and rewatch those same two videos waiting for them to come out. Moving into my thoughts about this album upon re-listening. First off, Top Down is an intro. It's not the best song, but it made for a cute tour opener when they did the little car. But Boss, Boss is like that girl. Like, every day is payday. Swipe my car, then I do the nay-nay. Yes, exactly. And then you have the bridge with the I pledge allegiance to my independent girls in here. This was the lead single. (laughs) <laughs> this was the lead single. It came out in 2014 and it was everything. Sledgehammer is also a certified bop and Worth It featuring Kid Ink. That one too, which for some reason I have never ever been able to listen to this song normally since that one Vine from many, many years ago where someone made a mashup of Worth It with that clip of Tanisha Thomas from Bad Girls Club waking up everyone in the house like, I ain't getting no sleep because of y'all. Y'all not gonna get no sleep because of me. I'm so sorry if you don't know what I'm talking about because it kind of sounds silly saying it out loud, but it was a pretty viral video and people started to actually recite it at the Fifth Harmony concerts. So if you don't know about it, go look it up. It was a thing. It's so silly. I think the best songs in this album, though, are Everlasting Love, Like Mariah featuring Tyga, which was my personal favorite back in the day. And then going back to Reflection, the title track, that one is also super strong. And it's also one of the multiple songs on this album written and produced by Victoria Monet. I told y'all, she's been at it for a while. And then Sugar Mama and We Know. That's a lot of favorites, but I think this is a pretty solid album if you want to have fun. I also noted that I don't think that Body Rock was one that I really liked a lot back in the day, but on Relisten now, it's a lot of fun. The final song on the deluxe album of Reflection is Brave, Honest, and Beautiful, which in a way pays homage to Destiny's Child in the intro, and then it features Megan Trainer, which I think is a pretty good fit, especially during that time Megan Trainer was huge then. This closing song is a good closer. I feel like it's a ribbon to tie together an album that isn't really cohesive, but is fun. It's very girly, sisterhood. It's the one track on the album that really feels like the same group that sang the songs on the debut EP. And that kind of segues into my general final thoughts on this project, which I think is in their top two out of their four, by the way. But I always wondered if this project took so long to come out partially because they were still trying to figure out how to market the girls. I mean, 
They started out, like I said, very Radio Disney, very kid, tween friendly. But like Fifth Harmony themselves, the girls, they were also a wide spanning older age range. You know, like they themselves, they were 17 to 21 years old at this point of release. And this album definitely does feel a bit more grown up and more mature compared to the first EP. It's not explicit, but it's also not clean. You can tell they're really trying to find their sound. So like I said, it's not the most cohesive. They're exploring a ton, but it's not bad. Now, I'm mainly focusing on the albums the girls released, but they did do some one-off singles throughout their careers. My favorite one, it's not even a real song. It wasn't on streaming or anything, so I have to shout it out because it's essentially a commercial, so you might have missed it, but it's one of their best songs, I'm telling you. It's called Rock Your Candies. It was part of their collaboration with the Candies clothing line at Kohl's, so it sounds so silly saying this, but it's so good. Like, the harmonies in this song, like the solo distribution is so good. I need every person to say that Fifth Harmony never sounded cohesive to go listen to this specific song. Like the R&B sound, the one, two, three, Fifth Harmony. Yes, I love it. So underrated. I just needed to shout that out and I need to stop singing. I'm sorry, guys. On May 20th, 2016, Fifth Harmony released 727, the album title being a direct reference to the date of their original formation on The X Factor, July 27th, 2012. So my thoughts on this album, That's My Girl, the first song, is probably the strongest album opening across all four projects. Work From Home is also a very fun single. I wouldn't say it's their best, but it was their best charting performance. It peaked at number four on the Billboard Hot 100. So with that criteria, it was their biggest song. It features Ty Dolla Sign, who is a nice addition to the song, but like most people, I will never ever be able to get that one clip of Camila with them when they were performing at that award show. I don't even know what award show it was. I will never be able to get that clip out of my head. I feel like it resurfaces every other month and it's so silly i don't know why it always comes back i also wrote here in my notes the question why does right on me bridge sound like a song from the lion king interesting i think that was the only part of the song that i actually liked this was one of my least favorites back in the day too but that one part does sound like the lion king in the bridge with camila let me know if you agree or if i'm tripping it really sounds like it could have been the lion king my favorite songs on this album are I Lied, Because It's Fun, It's Very Summery, Flex, All In My Head, the song that ignited this Fifth Harmony renaissance that we're literally talking about right now. I loved this song. It's another certified bop. 15-year-old me had that choreo down. 23-year-old me still has that choreo down. Seriously, I tried it in my room and I have that full choreo memorized still. Even the floor part that Camila does, it's so fun to do, although only my bedroom walls will ever see me do it. Squeeze, Gonna Get Better, Dope, and No Way were other songs that I listed to be in my top five, or I guess that would be top six of this album. No Way is a really nice ballad for the album, although the breathing sends me a little bit when you focus too much on it. Like, it's something that, unless somebody tells you, you won't notice it, but I noticed it immediately. So yeah, No Way though, it's, it's still a very beautiful ballad. I like it. It's fun. In general, I feel like when this album came out, I felt like it had a lot of skips, and unfortunately, I still think it does, but the good songs on this album outweigh that because the best songs on this album are better than some of the best songs on some of their other albums. The album also just feels very summer 2016 with a very poppy dance sound, lots of beat drops, and then quite a bit of tropical influence. It just screams summer 2016 and I love that so much. I also had the opportunity to see Fifth Harmony live again during this era at Hot 99.5's 2016 Jingle Ball. I think I talked about the Jingle Ball holiday concerts in our holiday special episode last December, but Fifth Harmony, they were on the lineup this year um, in 2016 at this show. It was actually a little bit weird, but I'll get into that in a second. They actually opened the show, and if I remember correctly, they opened with That's My Girl. So much fun. I told you it's a great opener wherever they go. And it was a nice fun run through the hits from 727, the whole set. I mean, the set they only play like for 20 minutes. I really wish I could have seen them on a full tour. I never really did. I only saw them at like special shows like this. It just never really worked out. And this was also my last time seeing all five members of Fifth Harmony together as a group. 
because, well, as we know it, Camila Cabello would soon be departing. And going back to what I was saying about things being a little bit weird, that's what I was talking about, because at this Jingle Ball, Camila sang on stage with Fifth Harmony, but then she came back out to perform solo the same night. She did her own set of just one song. She sang Bad Things featuring Machine Gun Kelly. And y'all, this was one of my favorite songs at the time, and I still love it now. This was back when Machine Gun Kelly was a rapper before his rebrand. This was honestly a really enjoyable performance, and honestly, I had no clue what was about to come. This wasn't Camila's first time releasing solo music while she was still in Fifth Harmony. She collaborated with Shawn Mendes before that on I Know What You Did Last Summer. That was a whole era, but I feel like no one really thought much of it. Y'all, at the end of the Jingle Ball tour, she was gone. I remember so vividly because I was on the way home, my birthday is in December, and so I went to DC Jingle Ball, and then my family, we drove down to Disney World for my birthday. It was like all at the same time. So I remember we were on our way back home, like I was in the car, and right after that last Jingle Ball tour date, boom, the post drops. Camila is leaving Fifth Harmony. And I, honestly, I have to say, this did not hurt me like Zane leaving One Direction hurt. I actually looked back at my tweets from when it happened, and I literally said, end quote, Unlike One Direction, though, I'm glad I got to see OT5 Fifth Harmony twice before Camila left. I said that, so I, I obviously was not that phased. But I remember thinking, the group is over, like, they must be over. Camila always seemed to get all of the solos. It seemed like if you were to divide up the fans, she had the most fans. And what sucks also is that it was such a messy departure. Like there were back and forth posts between Camila and the band account because of how that initial post was worded. It basically said, we have been informed by Camila's representatives that she's leaving. Like that's so messy. I mean, there was so much messiness before then. So it only made sense that the departure was drama filled. But Camila was transparent about starting a music career and Fifth Harmony said that they would continue on as for. As a One Direction fan, I knew what that meant, but it was just kind of like, whatever, Camila is gone. I always think that when a member leaves a music group, it's just the beginning of the end. I mean, historically, that's always how it works. They always say, we're going to keep going on without that member, but they never really truly can. One or two more albums will release and then the rest of the group is gone too. For Fifth Harmony, that final album was their self-titled album, released on August 25th, 2017. I think this is a pretty alright album. I mean, it has some good songs and proved that the group could stand on its own without Camila. I think it starts a little bit slow with Down, which is catchy, but a basic and flat opener that wouldn't really keep a non-fan invested, I don't think. Gucci Mane's inclusion feels a bit random also, just like the way his rap comes in. Although I did really like that part back in the day, so I can't really hate on this song because I did give it a lot of streams in 2017. But like, like I said, I think That's My Girl is just the strongest opener on any of their albums. My favorite songs on this album, he liked that. It's catchy, it's fun. The music video, Eats. Also, Sauced Up, Deliver. Some of the songs on this album are some of my favorite all-time Fifth Harmony songs, especially, especially Sauced Up and Deliver. Don't Say You Love Me is cute. It's girly. It's the final single from the girls before they announced the hiatus, with them each walking out of their own doors in the music video. And then we also have Angel, which also eats one of their best songs. The bass is so good in it. And Bridges also just kind of goes back to that sisterhood theme. I have to shout that out. Honestly, all three of their album closers give the same energy. But re-listening to Bridges, that one kind of made me a little bit sad considering what happens next. On March 19th, 2018, after four albums, 10 tours, 60 awards, and millions of sales, Fifth Harmony announced they would be going on an indefinite hiatus so that they could pursue solo careers. And no hate, no shade, but I really do appreciate the use of indefinite here and not something like, I don't know, 18 months. It doesn't give fans false hope. I have no expectations of Fifth Harmony coming back. That's all. Just to give my closing thoughts on Fifth Harmony, though, before we move into a quick chat on their solo careers, I want to say that while many people may make jokes about the group, yes, they lacked cohesion a lot of the time. Yes, some of their red carpet looks weren't the best. And yes, there were occasions of them trying to outsing each other or just clear awkwardness. I get it. But they were very special to me and to my preteen teen years. It was really great to have this girl group to be able to listen to and admire because 
The kids these days, they don't have that, which I could go on a rant on how we need more new girl groups. The way that 10 new boy bands just spawned to fill the hole that One Direction left when they went on a hiatus, we needed the girl group version of that. And I do know that there are some girl groups, shout out to Flo, but at the same time, I think there's an American barrier with them. I mean, they do good here, but they do better in Europe from what I've seen. I mean, they are a European based girl group. It kind of reminds me of Little Mix with them. And to answer that longstanding stand question of Fifth Harmony versus Little Mix, do I think in the long term, looking back, that Little Mix was better? Maybe, but Little Mix wasn't giving me an American fan enough. They wouldn't tour here, no TV appearances in the US, so I became a much more casual fan after their debut album. I feel like the way that it works is that Little Mix had definitely seemed to have a bigger fan base in the UK and Europe more than Fifth Harmony was in America, but neither girl group really seemed to break out of that bubble. So it was like Fifth Harmony was the American group that didn't really break into Europe and Little Mix was the European group that never broke into America fully. But I wouldn't pin the two up against each other like many fans do because both are very special to me. Overall though, Fifth Harmony's music had a very special blend of confidence, of being independent woman, but also love and sometimes even sisterhood. I do think a problem with Fifth Harmony's discography, it doesn't make it not good, but they seem to never really find their own voice and make their own path. They just consistently fall into this space of making music that sounds like whatever is trending in the moment, and it makes for a really good time capsule, but they're either falling into that stereotypical girl group song or like making music that would likely be a hit. But I mean, one thing for sure is that they always succeeded in making a bop, making a little fun hit. So yeah, we love Fifth Harmony at Fan Fave. Those are the girls. What's fun about Fifth Harmony is that all five of the girls pursued solo careers, which isn't so surprising when you remember that at their core, they were just a group of solo artists that were put together. So now we're going to talk about their solo careers. Camila left the group first, so we're going to talk about her first. I feel like Camila's early music was really good, but then I haven't really listened to her much since like post high school, but I don't think it's fully because of her music. It's for like other reasons too, but I did think that Camila was always one of the stronger members of the group. I know a lot of people joke about how she was always like over singing in the group, so that wasn't really harmony and fifth harmony, but I found that most of the time it was appreciated and it always did add to the performance and I mean again what do you expect from five teenage girls who are trying to be successful solo musicians and they get thrown together into a group and I mean you don't really have a say in that because it's like no I'd rather go home or do you want to take that chance and then I remember when Demi Lovato said in front of all of them that she felt that Camila was carrying the group and X Factor. So I feel like there was always probably that weird dynamic kind of there because how do you tell that to five teenage girls and not expect that to kind of become almost like a competition between them? I did get to see Solo Camila live two and a half times, the half being that 2016 Jingle Ball performance that I talked about with Machine Gun Kelly when she was still in Fifth Harmony. It was just one song, so that's why it's just a half. And then I saw her again. She did the solo set at Jingle Ball 2017, and that was a full solo Camila set. And then I also saw her when she opened up for Taylor Swift at the Reputation Stadium Tour in 2018. So I've never been to an actual Camila Cabello concert, and now that I think about it, has Camila ever actually done a full solo tour? I can't remember, and I know early on especially, I definitely would have wanted to go. Okay, I looked it up. She did do a tour in 2018, the Never Be The Same tour, but looking at the date, she came nowhere near me. I mean, New York, but that was on a weekday and that was a three and a half hour drive. My parents were not taking me to that in high school, especially when I would be seeing her two months later on the Reputation Stadium tour. And her tour for her sophomore album was canceled due to COVID. So yeah, I guess I never really had the chance. But anyways, my favorite Camila songs. First, can we talk about her debut era, the song she put out before she released her debut album officially, and then they didn't make the debut album. Like I Have Questions and Crying in the Club and OMG, 
literally omg i don't know if anyone else remembers but this is like oddly a core memory for me i think it was her very first solo set or one of the very first times she did a full set was at b96 summer jam in chicago and she debuted those songs live but they weren't out yet and i was all over those omg is so criminally underrated it was just as good if not better than havana it would have been a hit i stand on that on her debut album my favorites are she loves control into it in the dark consequences i also noted real friends is nice but it sounds like a revival reject like a song that selena gomez would have released in 2016 um, and then I also said that Havana and Senorita are still hits in my house. And then on her sophomore album, I really like Liar and full transparency past that. I haven't heard a single song on her third album. So yeah, 2018 era remains superior to me. It was a very fun time. Moving on to Lauren Haregi, who is criminally underrated. She had some very great releases in the beginning. Like Camila, I haven't really caught up with her latest new music, but she does have a very unique and soulful and raspy voice that I really love. And I don't think she really got enough spotlight during those first three Fifth Harmony projects especially. So since I've been kind of pulled back into the Fifth Harmony universe now, it might be the perfect time for me to re-listen. I did listen to some of the old ones that I loved. Some songs that I can recommend are More Than That, Expectations, and Back To Me. She was also on Strangers with Halsey. That was a really nice song as well. Now, Ali Brooke, Ali's solo music is actually pretty fun. I only know low key, but when I was listening around, I also heard No Good, and that was honestly very enjoyable too, you know? I actually saw her in concert back in 2019. It was a while ago at a radio station event in Baltimore, and I can't really remember that much because it was like, it was like three different artists. I know Bozzy was one because I wasn't paying full attention to her because I was in the meet and greet like line for Bozzy. But I did go back and find some videos from that concert and I'm literally singing along to her song Lips Don't Lie. So that's another one I guess that I liked back in the day. I honestly forgot about it but it is a pretty good song. I do wonder though why she hasn't had a bigger hit yet because her songs aren't bad and they feel very mainstream. Like they feel very top 40 radio if they were marketed like really well I really think that she could have a hit moving on to Dinah Jane I wasn't really familiar with any of her solo music actually but you know what it wasn't bad either I feel like yeah yeah that one is probably one of her most recent singles I think it will be stuck in my head I really liked this one I'm probably gonna add it to my playlist I really enjoyed it I am interested to see though what she does next because she was one of my favorites back in the group so I don't really know why I never got into her solo music more but Dinah Jane I support I'm gonna start listening to her more now because I really liked yeah yeah y'all should listen to that one it's pretty good now, of course, we have to end with Normani because she's so back. Normani's music track record has been so strong from the beginning. I mean, she had Love Lies back in 2018 with Khalid, which was a hit. It reached number nine on the Billboard Hot 100. I think Waves is also one of my all-time favorite songs of hers, but also Dancing with a Stranger with Sam Smith. She also has collaborated with Megan Thee Stallion, Cardi B, and Calvin Harris. She's just everywhere. And I think part of the reason why Normani does does so well is she really is a full package she sings and makes good music yes but she's also a fantastic dancer and provides great visuals with her music videos her motivation music video was a complete moment that's another favorite of mine that video alone was on repeat as i tried to like learn all the dance moves from it and comically failed repeatedly but it was fun trying you know and she pays homage to so many other artists in that music video too it's just so good I think Normani has the range for pop, but also R&B, and she's so easily marketable, so I'm really looking forward to what's to come because she has begun the rollout for her debut full-length album called Dopamine. It was so unexpected when she announced it last week, and I honestly think that, and I honestly love how she did it because... Over the years, so many people have pointed out her potential to be this huge star, but they kind of complain and make fun of her about how she doesn't actively release music. I mean, her discography is still pretty small, and Normani actually recently spoke out about why she had slowed down her releases, and that was because she was dealing with both of her parents fighting cancer. I really respect the fact that she did take that break for herself because family does come first, but now she is back, and I think that the way that she revealed it was like so funny. She she put it on a website where the URL was literally like 
where's the album.com, which is what everybody's been pressing her about over these years. And then she like quote tweeted a super old tweet where she had said that she finalized the album name. And that tweet was from 2018. So she is kind of poking fun at it all. So that's all nice. And we still don't have a release date for dopamine yet. But whenever it does come, I'm here and I'm ready for it. It's going to be such a great project. I'm seeing best new artists at the Grammys already for her. Like, come on, Normani. It's going to be amazing. Talking about all of these solo careers and just Fifth Harmony's music and impact has been so much fun, and I hope you all have enjoyed doing it with me. I just want to close with one final question, and that's, would I want a Fifth Harmony reunion? My answers are a little bit nuanced because I would love to see them together again, but I really think that they work better solo on their own. I just don't see Fifth Harmony like down the line, getting back together and it being a thing, but I wouldn't mind seeing them do like a short documentary type of thing where they reunite and it's like a tell-all or maybe they do a one-off performance of an acoustic set, something really laid back and chill for the fans would be really cute. But yeah, that's my thoughts on it. Let me know on social media if a Fifth Harmony reunion is something that you would want to see. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, tell a friend and make sure you let me know by leaving a review and following the podcast. As a reminder, at FanFave, it's all about the love for entertainment and the joy of being a fan. FanFave is active with even more content on social media, so make sure you don't miss anything. It's at FanFave Media everywhere. So connect with me because I want to hear from you, my fellow fans of pop culture. I'll see you next Tuesday when we'll dive into another aspect of pop culture. Thanks for listening and see you soon.